what are you guys calling this game? Would you call it a reinvention? What is the internal terminology for how you're approaching the new God of War? Ooh. We took a while to kind of arrive at that. It's not a, it's a reimagining, right? I think I'm calling it massive. Massive, yeah. Too big. Too Sorry, big. that's what you're, I'm calling it. Sorry. It's a continuation of the narrative. So it is a continuation sort of of the timeline of the world. I would say it is the next chapter in Kratos' life. We said reboot early on, but then realized reboot is the bad word because it may, makes it seem like we're going back to the origin, right. start. Yeah. So I think it is the the reimagining the evolution. of this world. The evolution. Ooh, we're actually coming in with this on the fly. Most of our homework is done the day of. Uh, <laughs> We've been so. doing this for four years and we right, still don't right. know what we're making. Yeah. Let's focus group this. <laughs> right. It's the evolution. Soft right. reboot's confusing for terminology. Yeah, soft reboot is kind of weird because, yeah. again, it's not, it's, it's not as if we're going back to the origin or we're trying to retell anything. It really is chapter two. He is moving forward to the next era. The way I was describing it to people in the early portions was the sort of Greek games were the Greek era of God of War. Moving on, the next mythological sort of belief system he interacts with will be that era as well. So it became the Norse era of God of War. But we may end up going on to the Egyptian era and the Mayan era uh, and, and so and so, so on and so forth. So many different eras we can potentially go to. It's also the era where he becomes a father. Yeah. So that's a huge step in what we've seen in terms of character with Kratos. Where he starts to take responsibility. Okay, becomes a father again. Again, yeah. Yeah, well, for real this time. I think he was kind of a jerk before. So how'd you know it was time to reimagine God of War? What uh, indicators were you two looking at to kind of prompt a, a shift in the way you're thinking about it? I think for me, just the dialogue the team was having, you know, wanted something new. We had been in Greek, um, you know, concept art for, what, a decade? Yeah. There were so many other opportunities out there. And Corey had been talking about different myths for years. Yeah, something new. Them. I think the audience as well kind of realized. They, it manifests, I think, in, in their feedback in the sense that they feel like Kratos' story is over. They're not wrong for thinking that, but I think at its root what they're saying is sort of the rut that we were stuck in was over, right? The idea of the vengeance tale and the anti-hero it's like, okay, that's cool, but we've sort of hit that note. Let's let's try something else. And, the, you know, one direction is to just clear everything off the table and start completely new, right? Uh, but I think another direction, I think the more challenging and interesting direction is to take somebody who, you know, is believed to not be redeemable and figure out how to take them to a point where you root for them, right? So that you spent so much time doing things that were sort of antithetical to what the player wanted. Right, like the the sort of classic puzzle in God of War One, the cage push puzzle. Uh, so many people did that, but they all said the same thing. Like I really didn't want to do that. Like I knew I had to do it, but I was feeling very uncomfortable for doing that. And that was sort of the purpose. It was to put a player in a situation that was not necessarily what they would want to do, but this is what the character had to do in order to achieve the goal that he wanted to. Shannon, I'm really interested in your perspective of, it seemed like yesterday when we are talking about this, is an interesting mix of, we want to bring in a seasoned developer that knows God of War to reimagine God of War. Why do you think those two pillars go together well? I think you need to know the lineage. I mean, it's a, it's a very deep storyline, and bringing in someone that understands that history is sort of the respect the franchise deserves. We don't want somebody that thinks they know um, the best next step, but really truly embodies it. And Corey, of course, with God of War II, um, you know, had that passion and... Um, Gotta know the rules to break the rules, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think he also had a great history in his interest in scripts and story narrative, which is where I think the consumer, our fan base, really wanted to see the franchise go. We wanted more of a, a storyline there. And meeting Corey in early days and talking about the possibility of him coming back to Santa Monica, it's one of the first things he started talking about was uh, the opportunity for story moving forward through that very long, windy discussion. Multiple times we hung out and talked about the possibility of him coming back to the studio. It was um, pretty clear that um, he had a lot of ideas of where to take things. Is it tough to not be precious with something you love and has such a defined taste like God of War, Corey? Or what's that like for you? 
I think it's a rip the bandaid off kind of moment that there is the thought. There was a point early on uh, where I, I thought, oh yeah, I'm totally not being precious. Uh, I told the core team that we had nothing is sacred. And literally the first thing Eric Williams talks to me about was, you know, okay, then what about the jump? <laughs> and I was like, oh, he's like, you know, if you want to try to do something with closer camera, you can't have double jumps all over the place. Like eventually we could get there, but I think initially let's make it a little easy on ourselves and try to tackle, you know, all new camera control and all new character control before we start taking on something like crazy double jumps with a close up camera. And that's where I was like, oh, hold on. So then I had to step back. So clearly I wasn't as comfortable as I thought I was with it, but you know, spending a little bit of time realizing, okay, this is what it's about. This is what we have to do. We have to literally rip all of the walls down so that we can figure out, you know, where is where where are the key pillars? Where are the things that are truly the load bearing uh, structures for this franchise that say without this, it really isn't God of War. Uh, and that's really where we came up with that concept of the the narrative, the exploration, and the combat. Those sort of three elements that you know, in, in a small part, exploration uh, was part of the original series, but it wasn't really blown up. And that was the one we said, let's make this a massive part. Let's like celebrate the curiosity and the discovery of what playing video games is all about, right? The moment that you first blow up a wall in, the, in Zelda and realize that there are other walls in the game that can blow up. You're like, what? Uh, I think that kind of thing is just phenomenal. That's unbelievable that, that games can offer stuff like that with that mentality then did you consider going open world in the early days a little bit uh I, it was at the time that i was playing some open world games and feeling a lot of fatigue in the sense that open world games felt like homework to me they're not bad you know just phenomenal games out there it's just that getting home from work and then seeing this gigantic list of things that you have to do and being easily distracted and not being able to understand what really is core started to feel like, okay, well, that's not what we do best, right? We are really wanting to focus on this character and the development of it. So going full open world felt maybe not in what we wanted to do. There was a thing that they had done in the Tomb Raider game where it was f feeling like, you know, wide linear, this idea of moving forward through the story, but having a lot of freedom, right? And Shadow of the Colossus is a great example that, well, they didn't have a lot going on in that world. I feel like I go wherever I wanted, right? I really was kind of free to explore and discover. And I was rewarded for that discovery, even though technically everybody discovered the same thing. I felt like I was the first person who discovered that. Uh, and I kind of wanted to capture that in this game without feeling like you'd walk away and have a thousand things to do, or right when you boot the game up, there's a giant map with 5,000 icons all over it. And you're just like, what do I do? Because uh, there's a lot of great games like that. I just don't think that we want to do that. Shannon, where are we in the industry where it seems like there's this broader trend for more intimate stories, more mature stories, kind of slow things down a bit? What do you think that says about the state of the game industry these days? We're so bold. I think it's a good sign. It means we're wiser. And wiser, that's a nice way to say it. Like that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, our, our fan base has grown with us and it really uh, allows us a lot more of a um, playground. You know, we're not just sitting in, in that standard Kratos vengeance. We're opening this up and I think with just hearing a lot of the diversity of storytelling that Corey's just even been brainstorming for the future, we've got so many different avenues, so many different paths ahead. Um, so I think there's a really great opportunity for people to come into this franchise at this point, as well as um, the, the guys and gals that have been with us for a long time to traverse this play field with us through Norse and wherever else the team wants to take take Kratos. Yeah, I think uh, this industry, we are in a in our sort of, you know, maturity development cycle uh, in a similar way that comic books and movies have been in, right? They have this sort of arc that they all go through. And I think we're still Arcing. right at the beginning of that period of time where people are realizing, oh, we can do serious stuff with this, right? It doesn't mean that we take ourselves so seriously that we can't be irreverent and silly at times. It's just that it is at this key tipping point where people are actually eager for this kind of material. People actually want to play a game in which they are, you know, emotionally challenged, that they actually see characters that they believe and relate to as opposed to just, well, he could do this cool mechanic, right? M mechanics are fantastic. Nobody wants to have something that doesn't have really well thought out and 
polished mechanics, but they also, they actually enjoy the why. The why is an important part of their experience now as opposed to just the what and the where, right? And the why am I here uh, driving them through these experiences is not new, but it is new in the sense that the broad audience is saying, I actually want that, right? It's not just give me a, a spectacle all the time. It's, I actually want all of that. I want the spectacle and the great mechanics and the story and everything. I think the team also, they wanted yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. They wanted yeah. more. I think we're all... We're, we're all, all having kids, you know. Um, Corey's has a son now. That's been a big influence for where we are with Kratos and Atreus. Um, and a lot of everyone on the floor, they're, you know, starting their families. Or um, I've got a 10-year-old son, so I know what it feels like to be in a circumstance where you don't quite know what the right answer is or you're frustrated with something that he's doing and how do you really parent the right way so a lot of the storyline mm. that that um, Corey and the writers have brought in I think a lot of us on the team understand and we can identify with that it's like a little like release valve we look at the early games and when we were doing play tests with people they would talk about this is the type of game they wanted to play because they had a hard day their teacher yelled at them their boss yelled at them they got a ticket, you know, they just had a frustrating day. They go home and they smack the buttons and, and let out some frustrations. And I think the phrase you just said hits it on the head. We're all guessing at the stage of our life that we're in right now. Mm, there's no rule book or, or even sort of, you know, laid out set of plans. So this game in some ways is helping us feel a little bit less lost in some of the decision making. We don't know the right answers. And it doesn't mean that this game even has the right answers, but it may be their sense of of solidarity when you see somebody also mess up. Struggling. Right? To, Struggle and mess you know up. What? Like, it's weird as people that we sort of want to see other people mess up to make ourselves feel better about stuff. That's why there's so much of this tabloid uh, journalism probably is that we just, hey, we love other people to fail because it makes us feel less shitty about failing as, uh, as we do. And so is the expectation that, you know, if someone picked up the original God of War and played it back in 2005, they see this new game on the shelf, it will perfectly match their evolution of like, oh, I guess I played that so many years ago, and now this is the kind of approach that I want. Do you expect that you guys are exactly in line with that crowd base and I the hope. fan base for the original game? Yeah, I hope. I don't know if everybody has gone down the same path, but I think as I look at it, it's more of the natural evolution of humanity, right? Like we're just, we're getting older, right? And we view life differently. Whether you know, you view life exactly how any individual character in the game views it. I think that's the cool thing about what we've done is there's so many characters. Uh, as we're starting to look at our playtests, we're seeing an unusual thing for us, but not an unusual thing, I think, for games in general, uh, that we have a diversity of memorable moments that is far greater than we've ever had in previous games. You have this sense of, oh, tell us what your most memorable moment was in the previous games. They'd all kind of nail the same three or four. You know, and you Which know you were succeed. intended to be memorable. Yeah, and you're like, this is what I wanted, and this is what we're achieving. And great, 20 out of 20 people are all hitting those same notes. 20 people play the game, maybe two of them have the same memorable moment, right? And and the memorable moments range from a single line from one character that spoke so strongly to them to an epic moment that is sort of bombastic to a moment that we didn't even think was that epic, but they perceived it as being this most like amazing, like epic thing. Right. And uh, I think that is partially because it's maybe a little too big. <laughs> uh, but also, I think just because we've really branched out, we have such an incredibly diverse team of people who are experiencing these differently. They're all offering a different perspective on things. They tell us a little anecdote or a story. Or they experience something and we're like, that's great. We need to put that in. That is the greatest thing about the sort of collaborative environment to work on a team is that by yourself sitting in a room writing a book, you'll have your one set of experiences, but when you have 300 people... It's not mechanical, right? I mean, no. we're talking about really, truly a craft, and that's the way everyone comes comes to work every day, is knowing that yeah. they're coming here to create and to partner and um, to realize something that uh, wouldn't have happened with a, a single, you know, Corey sitting in a room alone. Hey, well, I didn't include myself in that. Sitting in a room alone, I told you to make something amazing. Yes, of course. <laughs> Probably a children's book. 